Um, as um, Martin mentioned, um, about five years ago, I, uh, I packed up my tent. I arrived at EGA 2017 in Eildon. Um, and I arrived not knowing a soul. Um, and I was fortunate enough to sit in the audience and hear some of our local luminaries speak, um, and Dr. Martin Williams in particular, who really stood out for me. Um, and I was really, really blown away by the calibre of the speakers, and I think that that's continued uh, with each EGA that I've attended. Um, and it was also here that I realised, very sadly, that no one was doing psychedelic-assisted therapy, um, not, not just for, for my patients, but nowhere at all. Um, and I w had gone there, I guess, in the hopes of seeing if there was a place where I could send my terminally ill patients who were suffering, um, because we knew that they weren't responding to the talking therapy or the medication um, for many of them. But it was also here that I was inspired to throw my hat in the ring and um, initiate the study at St Vincent's. And um, yeah, as Martin said, it was a phone call within 24 hours. We were meeting for coffee and, and scribbling plans on serviettes, and here we are. So it is with some emotion and profound gratitude that I talk to you today, and I will never forget what EGA and PRISM have done for me and for this study. So that's where I start. Now, um, we're not finished. <laughs> so I can't talk about the findings in any great depth. But what I can tell you is um, some of the general observations that I've had as a clinical lead as well as the um, chief investigator. And I want to give you a little preview of, of our work later on as well. Um, just sharing some quotes from our participants. This is the first time we've ever done this. Um, and I share these quotes at their behest. Um, some of them are no longer with us, and they have asked that their story be told, or at least their experience of um, the, the treatment um, be told. So if we have some time afterwards, I will uh, endeavour to take questions, but I have plenty of questions that I still have myself, so uh, no guarantees, but I will endeavour to hopefully make this uh, some interest for you. So these are my 10 observations from the edge. And in no particular order, I will share with you the 10 things that I've noticed, just in general, kind of as we do this. These are problems and they are profundities. Um, <laughs> exit stage left. Um, these are things that have surprised me, things that have informed me and inspired me, but also troubled me as well. The general community, present company excluded, I think, <laughs> I would say. Actually, how many in the audience have not had a psychedelic? Okay, so you, you know I'm talking about the general community here, not the psychedelic community, okay? So we have a very problematic narrative right now in the public, and I'm very serious about this, um, because yeah, while you know, people, I guess, in the psychedelic community understand these compounds, they understand the seriousness of them, they understand how profound they can be, um, the general community do not understand these. And there has been, you know... Um, a surge of public interest um, uh, in psychedelics, and we've had thousands of inquiries, um, which on one level is a very useful metric, actually, because it helps us sort of underst you know, understand what the, the public psyche is um, uh, about psychedelics and how they understand them, um, and how little they actually understand them, and yet they are demanding them. Um, for our study, we've had many people contact us not realising that there is therapy involved for example, um, that they just pick it up from the pharmacy and take it in the car on the way home. Literally, that was one email. Um, they think it will magically kind of reset their anxiety or depression, um, that they can just sort of lay back and take the psilocybin, it'll just do, do all the work, and that they don't have to engage in any kind of challenging uh, emotional states. Um, and that they'll just get the, the peace and the love and that's all they want, you know, just reset my brain and thanks very much and I'll, I'll do that in my lunch break. Um, so there's, a, I, I think, a problem when you bring any intervention into medicine. Um, people then tend to take a bit of a passive role. Uh, they want you to fix their symptoms while they just lie back and you do the work. And it was the same with mindfulness as well. There was an idea that, you know, oh, you know, mindfulness will kill. So I'm going to go, I'm going to relax. But, oh, hang on a minute, I'm getting in touch with all these kind of problematic emotions. I don't like this. I, that was not what... I don't want to do a 45-minute body scan. This is... So, you know... Um, they're sort of wanting the, the quick cure and to bypass the psychological work, which is garbage. You know, in psychedelic-assisted therapy, um, 
we put you right in the crux of it and you're going to feel things and these are things that demand to be felt. And I think the difficulty is uh, people think that psychedelic compounds are the same as antidepressants, even at the macro level, uh, that you can kind of just set it and forget it. So they have no idea how challenging or overwhelming and sometimes discombobulating that the experiences can be. So they've heard that these are better than antidepressants. They've not heard how very different they are to antidepressants. So we have a problematic idea here that it's going to kind of, you know, wipe trauma, reset depressive patterns, you know, without engaging those kind of upsetting emotions. Um, and even for the people, we've had it, you know, a handful of people in our study who have had a, a previous experience of psychedelics, um, perhaps in a recreational setting, they've come to this thinking it will be similar. Um, only for it to be vastly different, actually, when you put it in a therapeutic container. Because the, you know, the whole therapy container is geared towards um, putting that person into a very deep personal introspection. Um, you know, external stimuli is reduced. We, we offer people eye shades and headphones so they can really immerse themselves in what's going on and do a bit of a deep dive into their psyche. So the therapy itself will, will hopefully hopefully bring forth some anxieties and conflicts that they can then potentially meet in quite a profound way um, in this altered state. So, and I say this because I think we've got some pretty big misunderstandings in the general community that, um, about what this actually looks like. And I guess the problem with that is that then people may be signing up for something that they don't understand. And that's when we're going to see more of your adverse events. Like, I didn't like this. I didn't like that feeling. It made me freak out. So, you know, we have to do some more talking about what psychedelics actually are. So this kind of leads me to my next point. It's not for everyone. Um, there's a quote down the bottom. I don't know if you can read it, but it's a great one from Jack Cornfield. And it said, my mind is like a bad neighbourhood. I try not to go there alone. <laughs> Um, look, we're, there are certain risks that we know about, okay? Uh, at least at this stage where we're at. Every protocol on this planet that is looking at psychedelic-assisted therapy will say that if you have a history of psychosis or a history of bipolar, this could trigger a relapse. So they are eliminated from studies. Um, now, there is, in saying that, in saying that, there is actually quite a bit of research underway, at least uh, to try and understand this and maybe treat uh, some forms of bipolar. Um, I've heard that there's even some, some work, I think, with, with psychosis as well in Basel. Um, so this is not to say that there won't be an avenue for this down the track, but at least at this stage, this is what we know in terms of the, the main risks that we know about. So unfortunately, we've got a lot of people with perhaps, you know, um, you know, lots of, lots of very, very severe uh, mental health concerns that, again, don't, don't quite know what, what they're, they're asking for, but they're demanding it. Um, so we know things like, you know, people who've got raw, unprocessed trauma, that takes quite a bit of work up, you know, a lot of somatic um, resourcing kind of work before you can kind of get to the point of giving someone a psychedelic assisted therapy dose session. Um, if people have a personality or, uh, you know, a lot of life experiences where they have developed issues with trust, and you know, difficulty with relationships. This is a very intense and very intimate form of therapy. Very intimate. Um, so that can be really triggering for some people. And this is the stuff that we, we haven't really talked about um, in our, our, our dialogues. Um, and, you know, and we know these factors already. But I guess in a general sense, it's this. And certainly this is what we've learned, I guess, in, in the trial. Um, if you have someone who has spent a good deal of their life trying to actively avoid their internal world or their emotions, um, or if they're a control freak and they like to be in control, you're probably not going to have a good time of this. Because, as we said, it will throw you into the crux of your psyche and demand that you feel all of it. Now, we have this conversation with people all the time. We are a very numbed society. We're not great at feeling our emotions. Um, and this is precisely what we want to do. We're using therapy and you know, a psychedelic compound to help um, augment the, the effectiveness of the therapy. So, you know, um, we're introducing something that makes people feel things in a very intense way and that can be a bit much for some people. Um, so I think it's important that we, we, we let people know it's bloody hard work. It's really hard work. Um, and it can, 
you know, amongst the bliss, amongst the joy, amongst the transcendent stuff, which I'll talk about shortly, but uh, if it, it can get a bit harrowing at times. It can get quite challenging for people. And if there's not a preparedness to kind of withstand that, they're going to have a real challenge there. It's just, um, and if they fight the experience, um, because I don't want to feel things, it's likely to be about four to six hours of pretty intense um, distress. And just as a side note as well, um, it's also not for every therapist. It's also not for every doctor, and it's not for every academic. Um, and unfortunately, some people, uh, I, I guess, kind of come to psychedelics and psychoassisted therapy for all sorts of reasons, and they, they can kind of be very wrapped up in their own sort of self-promotion or ambition or dreams of cash or success or, you know, kind of grandiose ideas. And um, sometimes you hear people kind of proudly cr proclaim that they'd, they'd had this psychedelic um, awakening and then all of a sudden, you know, um, it's changed my life, I'm going to set up a company, I'm going to make money, all of that, or I'm going to be, you know, this person who's going to steward the research in a certain direction. So it, people can get quite uh, uh, inflated here. And unfortunately, where there is resource, where there is where there is resource, where there is beauty, there, there will be predatory behaviour, unfortunately. Um, so we're mindful that, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky arena and it's, it's attracting all sorts of uh, people. A good colleague of mine um, uh, in the US actually said, you know, narcissism and psychedelics are a bad mix because if the, um, if the unselfing uh, that, we, that we talk about, you know, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that more later when we talk about transcendent sort of uh, experiences and ego death or dissolution of ego. So that unselfing doesn't take place. Um, uh, it can actually fortify narcissism in, in people who have a, te a tendency towards narcissism. So, um, and there are some good public examples of this. We don't have to look very far. Uh, and that's all I'll say on the map. <laughs> Um, and also, you know, I think for us as, as therapists, there's, there's something to be mindful of here. There's, there are therapists and sitters who can very easily get caught in the hoopers of this. When you have, uh, you know, and I can say I've had about 50 plus, 54 dose sessions that I've sat with now. And when it goes well, it is remarkable. You, you walk out of that room and you are on, like, light as a feather. It is just the most exquisite uh, vicarious transcendence that you can experience. If it doesn't go well, it's these sort of crushing loads. But... You can get caught in the hubris of that if we're not careful. You know, I did this. I gave that person. We didn't do that. That person did the work. And if any therapist or any sitter says that they do the work, run a mile because it's not true. Um, expectations. Michael Pollan. <laughs> uh, he's coming next year, I believe. Um, I want to thank him and throttle him. Um, Everyone said, I saw Michael, I read his book, I blah, blah. So, and they want everything. I want the bliss, I want the transcendence, I want the sublime. And unfortunately, the pollen effect uh, has meant that we now have these bliss seekers who have a very, very concrete idea of what they should experience and how they do what they want to experience. Um, and unfortunately, then people come and they just want the good slice of the psychedelics without understanding that this is a microscope into your internal world. So, you know, there's not just a good slice to us. There's the dark, there's the shitty, there's the, you know, the frightening, there's all of that. So um, when they have these unwanted experiences, they sort of try and uh, fight it and label it as a failed trip or a bad trip. And this is actually, unfortunately, very counter to the therapeutic experience where... Um, because if you come to therapy and you're just talking about good things and you're only feeling good things, it is a waste of your money. Um, it's sort of about learning to be in wise relationship to suffering. Uh, and you have, so, so that it doesn't overwhelm us, and you have this um, opportunity to meet your grief, your anger, your regret, your guilt, your shame, um, and then your joy and your, and your bliss as well. But you can meet these experiences in a very different way in this altered state. So, uh, but a lot of people don't want to feel those things so they can get caught up in going, no, I don't want that, I want this, I want this. So it can really limit your experience um, it, having these sort of uh, problematic expectations. Um, so in, in our study, we've had a few people who basically were like, meh, wasn't like Michael Pollan, 
described it. I think I need more. I need something else. Blah blah. blah and then and they sort of move on to, to find something else. So we really need to sort of start getting into discussions with people about what they're expecting, what they understand um, about psychedelics, um, what they're hoping for, and then work with that because we've really got we've got an, an interesting time. Obviously, people come out of the pandemic. They're weary. They're scared, and you know they're. We're all devastated. We've got a climate crisis happening around us, and and you know, we have a propensity to kind of put a godlike complex on new treatments that come out, and that's an enormous. I saw this. I have to say this very briefly. I saw an indigenous woman um, from the Shipibo tribe talking about her worries with the medicalisation of ayahuasca, and she said, "People come and they ask ayahuasca, you know, cure me of my depression and cure." The, she said, "That's a lot to ask of Mother Ayahuasca." <laughs> It's a lot of pressure to put on it. So, you know, um, yeah, so we, we have to be really mindful about what we're expecting here, and, and, uh, uh, um, and, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But, yeah, so we, we know it can get in the way. It can close down openness. Um, and I know we're not alone here. I know the studies overseas, you know, people are kind of appearing with a list of things, like a menu of, of stuff that they'd like to achieve and to do it as, in a short amount of time as possible. But the deal is this. As with psychedelics, your curriculum is whatever arises. You can't dictate the content. If you try to control it, you'll just end up fighting your experience and uh, missing out on what is. So the more you clench around that experience, the more, you know, the less able you'll be able to surrender into the experience and it demands surrender. So we really need to kind of teach people how to, to let go of the idea of how it's supposed to be. All right, the importance of ritual. This, this slide should also say culture and ritual and understanding cultural lens. What are our rituals? What are our, cult our personal, our, our collective rituals um, and the cultural framework within which we live and operate? To understand this, we need to understand the cultural lens through which that person looks at their life. You know, we're, we're actually very accustomed to doing this in palliative care because we must work with the person's cultural framework as they approach death. It is such a sensitive issue and culturally so loaded uh, for very, you know, very different you know, ways of understanding illness and death, we have to uh, understand how people view their illness through their cultural lens, how they view mortality and death. Do they believe in an afterlife? They may, they may not. Um, uh, and what are the sensitivities around this? You know, and what's that person's, you know, individual relationship to their culture as well? Do they have, they may not have the, the greatest relationship to their cultural framework. They may have found a new one and adopted a new kind of cultural framework. Um, and it's not just the cultural framework. It's, you know, about this person from this family um, at this time in their life um, with this set of experiences. So really getting to know that person and then understanding what their rituals are. And then there's the psychedelic experience. Look at the rituals um, of psychedelic use in Indigenous ceremony, which were beautiful and uh, deeply meaningful and th it threaded people through the entire experience. Um, now, as Westerners, we are largely disconnected from our wisdom lineages. Our rituals were discarded, so, you know, moving through transitions and now very, you know, largely cerebral, uh, downplayed, disregarded, celebrated with alcohol or kind of numbed, and not really given the spiritual depth and time and ritual that they deserve. And, uh, you know, for example, we, we rush grief, we use therapy and self-help like it's a Macca's drive through you know, demanding people get back to work. You know, we, we, we have this way um, in, in medicine of, of trying to reduce things down. We lost an enormous amount when we discarded ritual um, and we need to bring it back and we certainly need to bring it back to this, to uh, psychedelic assisted therapy in however we can because um, medicine tends to uh, do away with this. But this is so important to understand the cultural lens in, in, in the people that we work with um, and their rituals. We need to identify this, even just in the screening and the preparation. So this is beyond clinical trial protocols. Um, so this is, this is what we do. We begin, we get to know them, obviously. These are our rituals that we do. We offer them, obviously, tea, sort of part of our ritual, you know, the gesture of tea, come in, you're welcome. Um, we offer them a book so that they can uh, record their experiences. We do artwork with them. So there's a collective kind of a shared experience here. We know that uh, rituals promote social bonding and so it's wonderful for rapport. 
um, the artwork is then brought into the, to the dose room with them. We gradually lower the lighting as we move into the dose space. Each visit, it's lowered to kind of symbolise moving deeper within. We offer poetry. We encourage very deep reflection in the lead up to the dose day. We encourage people to kind of, you know, see if they can, you know, uh, cultivate time for internal focus uh, so that they can then kind of, you know, uh, prepare themselves for, for really kind of moving more deeply into the space. We ask them if they have objects of meaning that they would like to bring into the dose room um, to kind of infuse them into the, to the dose space. And we ask them if they have a ritual they would like to perform. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, we're shortly to uh, see a participant who um, starts the day uh, with tea ceremony and has asked that um, we do tea ceremony with them before they begin on the dose day. So this is this way of kind of, it, you know, it can be really useful to kind of bring the familiar into a situation where there's uncertainty. We know that that ritual helps with uncertainty and, and easing in. Um, but also it's, it's, a re it's really wonderful for them to kind of feel like that the, this treatment is, is kind of personal to them and very deeply meaningful for them. And then there is the importance of ritual for therapists as well. You know, we can leave those spaces under the influence of the transcendent quite awestruck and uh, exhausted, shaken sometimes. Um, we need our rituals too. Um, you know, I, I remember having um, a very profound dose experience with a, a participant who um, had a conversation with their cancer and it was heaving sobs. It was very, very emotional in the room. On top of that, there's very evocative music playing in the background. I'll talk about music later. But then at some point, you know, with this smile and just tears and tears had reached out for my hand and said, Marg, I'm, I'm in a state of grace. And, and I was teary as well, goosebumps, all that kind of thing. Uh, go home to my husband. How was your day? <laughs> It's, it can be quite jarring. We need a third space. This is very, it's very intense work. You also, you're in a room for about, you know, s several hours. It kind of feels like a, a long haul flight. It's, you're in um, kind of uh, this intimate experience with your participant that you're kind of setting up camp with them in a way. So, um, yeah, we do need a third space to, to kind of integrate what's happening and what we're seeing as well. It will leave an indelible mark. So, yeah. Okay, this may seem like a no-brainer. And for many of you, it probably sounds like it is a no-brainer. Um, the intention has been of utmost importance to our participants, and they frequently remark upon this. So this is the, th the, the intention that they bring in to their dose experience, what they're hoping that the treatment will show them or give them at the end of it, how the treatment will perhaps have shifted them, how they'll know that the treatment has, say, worked for them. But it's the thread that weaves them through the preparation, through the dose day experience, and the integration. It's kind of like a compass rather than a map. It's not very detailed in, in that way. It needs a degree of flexibility. Um, so you can have an idea of what you might like to experience or, or, or confront, but it's not a detailed, rigid idea. So then there is also the paradox of setting intention, because once you ingest, um, you have to then kind of just kind of go, all right, I'm not going to drive this, and, and allow the psilocybin to drive you. Um, and we often instruct participants to sort of think of it as if they were kind of setting a tone um, for what may emerge. You know, like if you fall asleep during a movie and, uh, and then some of the theme of that movie can then kind of enter some of your dreams. It's, it's sort of in, in that way, not dissimilar. If you're thinking on an intention, if you're meditating on an intention, it's more likely that that theme will st sort of stick around in your psyche um, and hopefully sort of emerge um, in the dose day experience. But... Um, the importance of this, participants have often remarked how important that intention was because it helps remind them during those challenging moments why they're there, what they're hoping for. Um, so they've used, they use their intention like a touchstone when they're in those, those really challenging, almost kind of harrowing uh, experiences to help them stay the course. Uh, and it also helps them 
do something really important, and that is they get curious about the challenge. What is that? Why, you know, this is a manifestation of my mind. What is that? Why are you here? What are you here to teach me? Which is this radical act from a, from a therapeutic point of view, as a psychologist, to move into something that is painful, to move into something that is challenging, and then the anxiety will just dissolve much more quickly. So the curiosity uh, and the, the, this intention that kind of helps them... Uh, I think positions them in a perfect place before they move into into the um, the, the dose session. So they really kind of approach it with a curious mindset, very engaged mindset, um, and uh, yeah, and recalling their intention helps it kind of keep going. Then after the dose sessions, you know, reflecting on the intention um, has been a way of kind of stitching it all together um, and uh, work with the the integration of moving forward. So you know, there's been a few times we have heard the phrase, "I didn't get what I wanted, but I got what I needed." Um, because given the opportunity, what is needing attending to uh, will, will come up for that person. And here's where we've used artwork. And I really like the question that, that was asked earlier about the, the place of, of artwork here and how we're understanding that. Um, we've, we've used artwork to shape and help shape intention. The unconscious will speak through art. You know, words can kind of... we can. Uh, we can put all sorts of guises on words and we can hide out in words. Um, it's much easier. The unconscious will speak through art and through, through creative um, therapies. And we've seen quite a marked difference in, in spoken intention versus artwork. It's been fascinating to see this. For example, we had a, a, a participant who made an intention sculpture out of clay. And um, in the beginning, it sort of looked like a, um, an hourglass sort of, you know, like this is like that, and then so these two sort of things, and then, but sort of on the side, and said, no, I think it's on its side. And their, their experience of it was, they said, well, I think this is sort of these opposing conflicts that I've got, and you know, I won't go into details, but um, after the dose experience was completely different, looked back and said, no, it wasn't about conflict after all. It was infinity. I saw it in my experience, and I felt infinity. And then this piece of art that she had created um, served as a very powerful uh, symbolic cue for her. Um, and very briefly, I know I'm running out of time, um, that brings us to integration. You know, it's, it's easy for people to think, I think in the general community, not so much the psychedelic community, but to think that it's all about the psilocybin dose day. Like, that's it, nothing else to do, it's all done now. But um, the integration is the difference between this just being an interesting day versus very lasting change. How you think about this, how you make sense of it, how you consolidate insights, how you move forward, how you can you know, practice kind of new ways of responding and, and, and thinking around things. Um, you know, we've seen people who really go after this and do everything they can to sort of try and you know, really consolidate this, this understanding. We've seen people who go, meh, it'll happen on its own. I can unequivocally tell you that if uh, people cultivate time to integrate their experiences, they do much better. Um, and, you know, how do we do this? So you're probably asking. Um, I will say that the answer is very individual, but uh, requires much, much more than just talking therapy. Um, my supervisor, Dr. Tim Reed, puts this beautifully when he sort of says, you know, that uh, integration process is multi-layered. There's kind of the low-hanging fruit, which is kind of the, the more kind of uh, um, apparent discussion and explicit discussion about what's happened. But then some of the fruit lie higher in the branches, and one has to reach for it. And this will take time and patience. We talked about this briefly on the, on the, uh, the, the panel. Um, you know, sometimes integration takes many months and years. Um, and so we, we need to understand that, that integration takes time. And we have to slow the process down. And we, again, we have this very, you know, fast pace. We want the, you know, I want my cue. I want it now. I want it in my lunch break. Um, but it does take time. Our psyches are slow. We need time to really kind of let things percolate. Um, also, just a very important point about integration. Our participants have really benefited and needed the buy-in of family or loved ones. Um, sometimes the work of integration is quite arduous and it can be um, challenging. So we have to think about what supports people when things get a little bit shaky. You know, um, uh, how, you know who, who's there for me if, it, if I get a bit overwhelmed? you know, and trying new things and being able to kind of talk about their experiences. Um, so family and social connections really matter here and I believe that they've been really integral to the good outcomes of the participants. 
um, in their integration process. This has been one of the gems. So one of these gorgeous surprises that, that bubble up during the process. When you're dying, your sense of personhood is so, and your identity is so under assault. Your body is changed, your identity, who you are, your role is completely changed. Um, your body becomes unwell, you become impacted by disease and treatments, and you feel this crippling fatigue. And you can feel very done to um, and reduced to the experience of a patient. And it's not uncommon for us to hear that people will lose touch with their, their vitality uh, and their creative acts, aspects. And one of the most surprising side effects is that we seem to be seeing in our participants is this reclaiming of the libidinal and eros. Now, when I say eros, I don't just mean sexual love, uh, but I mean vitality and creative, uh, your creative process, creativity, um, or, or reconnecting to some kind of vital aspect that had been buried by fatigue and illness. Um, and so... This is a really powerful thing. Our participants can experience a treatment that for once is not sedating, um, that doesn't make them feel sedated, that they can re-experience this very fatigued and very diseased body and a bewildered and anxious mind in a really vibrant way. So what are we seeing? For some people, um, a reclaiming of the sensuousness of, of, of life, you know, the, the, the you know, uh, eating, just enjoying a flower, all those, those kind of those beautiful moments, surge of curiosity, um, re-engagement in creative pursuit, some never undertaken before. Um, and even for some, a feeling of, of kind of sexual aliveness again, uh, increase in dreaming. So there's this really strong kind of uh, life force that, that can come up for um, our participants and they're often um, taken aback by it and delighted by it as well. And remembering these aspects that felt deadened or inaccessible somehow. And I think you know, Esther Perel talks about uh, eros as being the antidote to death, and I would agree. Uh, so it's been really, really wonderful um, to see how people have remembered themselves home in some way and reclaim aspects of themselves. I don't need to say much here. <laughs> so, <laughs> we focus too much on words, um, and particularly therapists, too much at the expense of other languages, and th in this domain, words fail us frequently. Um, and it's important to, yes, it is important to create a narrative or you know, make sense of the experience and talk it out, of course, um, but only using language to do this risks reducing it to just a mere cerebral kind of event and pulls us further away from the visceral and being able to kind of re-experience that really embodied experience of, of the transcendent. And we're trying to wrap, wrap public language around transcendent states, which is virtually impossible. Um, and cognitively, anyway, we may actually be telling more than we know. It could be, you know, empty kind of words. We need other means to access this uh, and re-access those, those experiences. And this has to include music, art. Um, it, Dance, sculpture, using visionary art. Many of our participants have used visionary art or, or cues, sculptures, or something that make them go, oh, that reminds me, oh my God, like that, that time when I felt this, you know, this absolutely ancient maternal love, and there's this beautiful heart or a picture of a heart or some, um, uh, some other kind of way of cueing that experience in a really powerful way. Um, and... Yeah, so we, these are things that we, we need to do to engage kind of the symbolic, and this is sometimes our only way of, of being able to kind of reach a person where they can go, yes, yep, that's exactly what it was like. Um, it, it may be engaging in spiritual practice, meditation, breath work, um, but also being close to nature is probably, you know, and the symbolic, engaging in what we call soft fascination when you gaze at something extraordinary. Um, and that we can kind of continue to, we, we really need to continue to work in the symbolic even uh, through integration as well. So we need to speak in multi-layered and multi kind of lingual kind of ways to our participant frequently and most importantly, it's not always words. Now this is what they're looking for. Um, cosmic reassurance. 
And I believe from what I've observed, um, this is the art of psilocybin at end of life, where we can find our place in the universe. It can be sublime and it can be terrifying, and it often is. The, um, the nature of the transcendent is that, you know, uh, that it's expansive and cosmic, yet it can also, uh, you can experience it as being like a kind of insignificance in the face of it all, um, or a nothingness, which can feel quite terrifying for people. But it's such an elusive experience in ordinary waking states. You can experience um, spontaneous moments of transcendence. But when you, know, when you see something beautiful or during meditation and so forth, but it can't be summoned. It comes out of nowhere. You don't get to say when or how it comes to you. Um, and the more you seek, the more you clench, the less likely it will descend on you. And it requires the opposite. It requires active surrender. And psilocybin is the art of surrender. Uh, if you can surrender, this is more likely, you know, or will come unbidden. And there was some interesting research about or um, made by Keltner and colleagues, and they talk about awe as being a kind of a reset button for the brain. This is just, this is regardless of, of psilocybin, this is awe in general. Um, and they describe awe as sort of like being in the upper reaches of pleasure and on the boundary of fear. And this is where it lay. Awe is, I love talking about awe. Um, and one of the reasons it's termed a reset butter is because the grandeur or the enormity of what we're exposed to or what we're experiencing overwhelms us. So we don't have a response at the ready. So our usual uh, frames of reference don't, don't fit. So, so new perspectives are then needed to accommodate this, way of, this new way of experiencing. Um, and it reaches beyond the rational and, uh, and the logical. It is the sublime. It's in the realm of the sublime. But before we arrive there, and this is important, now this has happened and we've seen this time and time again with our participants, um, a type of unselfing kind of takes place, which can be unsettling. By unselfing, I mean a kind of detachment from the conceptual notion of self, from the time scale of life, uh, and indeed the way we kind of know life to be. There's, um, and the separation between self and other can kind of be dissolved in this space, but this is the common place where people tend to fight the experience or want to run from it because it can be frightening. Because the prelude, oh sorry, I was a bit close, <laughs> um, but the prelude to the numinous can involve primal, um, terrifying experiences, ego death, uh, sloughing off of memories. You know, we've had people kind of go, I felt like my memories were kind of being ripped from me and I was like, oh, I don't like this. Um, being ripped apart, seeing malevolent characters. And that's the part where if they can stay the course, the numinous can, can burst through. Um, the experience of the death in the symbolic. And when you think your death is sort of largely this imagined mystery, it's feared, it's completely unknown. Irvin Yalom, you know, the great analyst or existential um, therapist, talks about you know facing death is much like staring at the sun. We have to kind of look away, um, and the proclivity is to look away at that point. But if you can sort of stay the course, for, so for someone who is terminally ill, you know, death is very close by, but it's 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 terrifying and it's uncertain, and these experiences seem to make death accessible to them in, a, in the symbolic and in the visceral uh, so that they can be in relationship to it in some way and to know it in some way. And then they can experience it in a very, very, a vastly different way that's not full of terror, but it can feel quite peaceful, uh, wise uh, or, or loving. So to move you know, beyond death into the transcendent and return from that, uh, the kind of the die before you die notion has been a real game changer for some of our participants. Okay. So it is staggering to me that more attention has not been paid to the role of music in psychedelic assisted therapies, save for Mendel Kalin and Bill Richards has talked about this too, but here are the facts. Music therapists, composers, musicians, you will be needed in this space. And even if you are an aspiring therapist, um, uh, is that a little clap? Yes, I'll clap for you. Musicians belong here. Um, um, even if you're an inspire, you know, aspiring therapist who wants to work in this, but you need to know this too. Um, and we also need to think about uh, something that, that we're seeing much more of. The onset of the psilocybin varies greatly. We've had people respond in 15 minutes, and then we've had people three hours in, thinking they've got placebo, going, oh, I think I can, oh, nothing's happening all of a sudden. Um, 
and they go, oh, I feel a bit stoned. I'm like, oh, lay, lay back down, it's about to hit you. So it, we can have such a variation in the, the time of onset. Now, um, you'll need to be aware of this because the playlists are designed to kind of move with the mechanism of the drug action. You know, when these are kind of crudely measured sort of in five parts, so you may need to DJ them a little bit. Um, so that, the, you know, because the music that is designed to move you into peak phase is very different to the music that's kind of bringing you back out. So, uh, you know, in a general sense, it's important to sort of get a sense of when that is. And we've certainly had to do that where we've gone, oh, my God, it's three hours in and it's starting to get really beady. You know, hot's about to come on. My God, you know, we had to move them back to peak. So, um, and also just even understanding things like how non-lyric and unfamiliar can allow for more space. Um, uh, you know, if something's got lyric, if it's more familiar, it can kind of um, limit your experience and uh, pull you sometimes into memories or associations that can uh, kind of, again, corral your experience a little bit. How various chordal progressions can kind of, you know, ev evoke grief or joy, uh, depending on how they're situated. So, um, yeah, I, I think um, at this point I would like to share something with you, which is the, the quotes from, our, from our, patient, our patients. And I'd like to do this while I'm introducing you to our fourth therapist in the room. Um, I could never have anticipated the importance of music in this therapy, but of course it's important. How do we grieve like we listen to music? You know, how do we release anger? How do we celebrate? How do we move on? How do we say goodbye? And I had to think very carefully about this. How do I you know, create a playlist, you know, as a team we were asking ourselves this, how do we help people say goodbye to loved ones? How do we help them face the unknown? Um, how do I use music to help a young mum say goodbye to her daughter? How do I help a young dad say goodbye to his teenagers? or someone in their 70s who, en who has enjoyed every, you know, last top of their life and aren't ready to let go. And those, you know, music can do things that words cannot. So I'm going to give the mic to my patients now um, and share with you some of their experiences that they have asked us to, to say or to, to, uh, to share and uh, with a piece of music from our playlist. So over to the music.
partners when their loved one has approached death um, and asked to play the playlist um, while they were dying. We, uh, we couldn't give them the psilocybin, but we could give them the music. And I have to say this, um, I've worked as a clinical psychologist uh, on palliative care wards for over a decade. Um, and for some people, not all, but for some, if you offer them psilocybin-assisted therapy and music to help them face their mortality uh, to achieve some kind of peace and resolution, this is, it is unparalleled. Nothing comes close to this, nothing. Um, I'm now getting to the end of my talk. A very quick word for the dying person. Um, that death may be coming, you know, but that they can kind of step back, um, appreciate how they lived, uh, that how they tried, how they survived, how they thrived, to, and sort of step back as if they were painting a masterpiece um, and appreciate it in a whole other way. Um, important to notice. <laughs> Psilocybin is not a panacea. After the ecstasy, the laundry. Um, they still have cancer, they're still going to die. There, there's still some very painful realities here. Um, and I think um, th there are limits to, to psychedelic assisted therapy, you know, beyond our study. Important to note this, psilocybin will not pay your mortgage. It won't fix broken systems, so we hope it will. But I'm mindful that we, that we don't emphasise, you know, oh, why isn't your depression getting better and you didn't do enough yoga, we didn't do enough therapy. Look around us, we're in a climate crisis. There's a lot of emphasis on the individual, a lot of pressure on the individual to cure themselves. And I think we need to kind of um, understand that there's some social determinants here of, of, of why we are feeling the way we are. Uh, so we need to kind of ease up on, on those sort of expectations of ourselves a little. Where to from here? I have the very good privilege of braiding together the numinous and the scientific. And it's a peculiar, I guess, meta miracle to kind of bring those uh, together, those very different modes of sense making and experience. Um, uh, I am concerned that we are putting a little too much emphasis on the clinical and the medical aspects of psychedelics solely for mental health problems. And that in some way, perhaps our, our translation of this has been subverted. Um, that psychedelics should only be a, kind of available in a medical context, that we're kind of applying this as a treatment for broken places instead of tired places uh, on our psyche or during moments of life transition or, or times when we need to shed our skins or as an opportunity for people to kind of uh, gather themselves for their highest moments. Simply put, can we just have access to psychedelics for spiritual well-being? Um, because research... You know, medicine, psychiatry is only one portion of a greater community of people and disciplines um, that have an interest here, and we should not be the only ones uh, with access. Um, and I don't think that psychedelics should only be available within the four white walls of a clinic. But I do think as a community and culturally, we need to develop wise relationship to these compounds and plants and fungi, listen to our global elders, uh, and you know, take these compounds seriously and approach psychedelic experiences with ref reflection, good preparation, with care, with humility, with reverence and respect to the wisdom uh, traditions and lineages that informed this use. And this is where I leave you, um, with a very deep bow of gratitude and acknowledgement to our Indigenous sisters and brothers who have held space uh, with these plant medicines and the keepers of the wisdom traditions and and also to the psychedelic community um, who have so selflessly offered uh, their stories and their learnings and their anecdotes, you know, um, which has actually informed some of our safety protocols, uh, you know, going back, our ideas and, and, and knowledge, and certainly to, even though he hates the word elders, um, <laughs> but um, the luminaries from, the, from, from EGA and from PRISM um, and the psychedelic community who have shaped my learning and knowledge. I thank you for your wisdom and for protecting these plants and for this very deep and ancient knowledge. Thank you very much. Um, when I received this email on the 2nd of January, 
2018 from this person whom I didn't know at all. I had no idea just how um, articulate, compassionate, wise, amazing gem I'd be working with. To, to bring this about in Australia. So thank you, Mark, and the team at St. V's and everything, for everything you've done. Um, I am able to take questions both at the, I think, at the mic there, is that right? We also have the Slido going. Uh, I have one excellent question to start with, as long as Slido will let me in. Yeah. Which was, is it possible to allow for the experiencer to have access to some natural spaces such as the sky, stars, trees, insects, the plethora of nature? Oh. Uh, love your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. A good question, a beautiful question. And yes, we want to move this out of the bloody hospital. Um, you know, I mean, how much more augmented would your experience of all be when you're near the forest and, and you're in, um, you know, you're near the natural world and, and you know, bodies of water? I mean, don't jump into it. <laughs> but, um, you know, to, to have the, 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 the grandeur and the... the uh, the beauty of the natural world and how much more, you know, augmented your experience of awe would be uh, to, to be in those natural surroundings. I would love to see it move into that, into that place, yeah. It would be wonderful, um, particularly for people who feel so uh, medicalised as well. Um, look, first cap off the rank, we, we have to do it, obviously, in the, in the hospital setting. It's for safety reasons and that's what our... Um, Ethics Committee would like, you know, from, from a safety point of view. Once we've established the safety, I think we can move into more natural surroundings. But thank you, I think it's a really good point. Thank you. Uh, question from the floor. Thank you so much for your talk. What a beautiful one to end it on. I'm just curious how you feel about the relevance of the therapists and the team having mm. traveled to those transcendental places to be yeah. able to shepherd the clients yeah. across and like what kind of experience mm -hmm. do you feel is relevant? Yeah, um, very relevant. It's a whole other terrain. I think when you when you move into altered states and you're helping to sort of navigate people, you, you need to have an experience of an altered state yourself, whether that be childbirth, whether that be you know, deep meditative states. Um, if you can have an experience of psychedelics, I think that is optimal. Um, because it's just so, so different to the usual talking therapy that, that uh, you know, therapists are accustomed to. So it to, you know, and one of the biggest um, risks is that they'll hit the panic switch. And it's actually, what they're going through is, is quite a normal process, you know, under a psychedelic. But if you've not seen that before, that can, you know, freak out therapists. So, um, yeah, I think that, that having an experience of that is very important. Thank you. It was a good point. Good question. Next question from the floor. Thank you. Hi, Margaret. Um, thanks for sharing some of the work that you're doing with us and for a deeply moving presentation. Um, Thank you. I have perhaps a bit of a controversial question. Sure. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on the uh, about St Vincent's opposition to the voluntary uh, dying assistance bill? Oh, yeah. Bill? Good question. And I wondered when that was going to come. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah. the possibility of the implication of religiously aligned organisation yeah. obstructing access to certain therapies. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a good question. And I have to preface it by saying my views do not necessarily represent that of the organisation that I work for. <laughs> Um, uh, what can I tell you? Um, I am not in favour of anyone blocking access to VAD um, at all. In fact, we've actually uh, had a couple of people in our study who have also applied for VAD because that's important that they have that. I think one of the things that worries me, actually, is that... Um, uh, a very concrete way or you know, interpretation of study findings that have, particularly that have come out of the US is that it can reduce desire for haste and death. My worry about that is that then that could be very kind of uh, crudely applied insofar as, that, oh, okay, well then, you know, people have to then do psychedelic assisted therapy before they access euthanasia. I am absolutely vehemently opposed to that. Um, people should have access to that no matter what. And also you cannot... Uh, 
force people to do psychotherapy and certainly not psychedelic assistive therapy in order to sort of tick something off. Um, yeah, I think that people should have access to euthanasia, period. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. I've just got a couple uh, through Slido, so Sorry, I'll go everyone, to those I know you want to go for wine. <laughs> next one, is that all right? Um, is psilocybin physically safe for people with health problems at older ages? Um, from what we're seeing, the, the, the medical uh, tolerability is actually remarkable. We've had people with um, um, quite severe cardiac failure tolerate it beautifully. Um, I think, uh, you know, and we've, we've actually been... Uh, a little bit renegade, we, we changed some of the exclusions and we let them know in the US and they're like, what? How did you do that? Um, because we realised in talking with people, you know, people who were on taxol chemotherapies, for example, um, we're not allowed to be on it. And we're like, why? A, if you have a three-day washout, it's, it's safe. Um, and we spoke with and consulted with, you know, a number of oncologists and toxicologists, and they said, yeah, it shouldn't be an issue. But these were just sort of these old uh, ideas that, you know, it, it might be. A problem. Um, and we had a woman who uh, was receiving paclitaxel, and it's a very common uh, maintenance chemotherapy in stage four breast ovarian cancers and so forth. And, and this uh, person said to me, you know, if, if, if I can't be on this study because of this chemotherapy, it's going to eliminate a lot of women like me, a lot of people like me. Um, and that's what prompted us to change that exclusion. So now people can very safely, and we've argued this, uh, they can very safely take um, psilocybin with, with um, um, paclitaxel and taxol therapies. So this is sort of, yeah, broadened it out. But yes, um, fairly safe. I think things like, for example, we did also the first uh, motor neuron disease uh, patient globally. Um, we have to be mindful of things like secretions and so forth, so safety issues from that point of view. But otherwise, it's, um, we've been very, very happy with how well it's been tolerated. Yeah. I think probably in the very early stages of clinical mm -hmm. reintroduction of psychedelic therapies then they were probably defensively very conservative in Absolutely. their exclusion criteria but I think that's yeah. really because um, yeah. with increasing uh, result, mm -hmm. gathering of results I think we're just seeing a gradual yeah. sort of um, yeah. uh, acceptance that, that probably yeah. those could be relaxed to a degree. Thanks. Yeah. Um, one from the floor then I'll uh, do another Slido question please. Oh, yeah, just some very sort of practical, quick-fire questions. Um, so all the participants, did they just have one session or...? Uh, no, so it was two, two dose sessions. Oh, the first okay. one was an RCT, the thing that I just completely shat on before. <laughs> okay. No, it does, have, it does have a use. I don't want to completely throw it out. Um, so the first dose is um, uh, double-blinded. They don't know. Therapists don't know. Um, there's a way of knowing. I think we all kind of know what's going on by about lunchtime. Um, but um, so, and then we sort of follow people up for six weeks, which is sort of the, the time defined by FDA as being kind of, you know, uh, you can demonstrate that it's superior to placebo. Um, the second dose is an open label dose. This is very common in, in, in cancer uh, trials because ethically we didn't feel right about kind of going, oh, sorry, you got the placebo, bye. Um, we wanted people to have at least one full experience of the, the treatment. And I, I guess the, the advantage with that is that we're now kind of seeing if we can understand, you know, whether one or uh, two doses is superior. So, so, yeah. so did the... We're not there yet, I can't tell you, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm saying, did the results last or did most of them die before you... Sorry? The... Like, their results, like... Mm -hmm. the, the ones that had a good experience, yeah. did that maintain? Mm. Um, You'll have to stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> March. So, yeah. When, 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 the, when yeah. the study findings okay. are full, we'll, we'll, we can tell oh, you. so it finishes yeah. in March? Yes, yeah. Oh, so okay. if we, when we're finished, we can tell you all that. Sort of, these are just sort of the, the, the things that I can talk about in terms yeah. of observations. So, yeah. Okay. I'll just ask a question that's come through from Alex. How did you construct your music playlist and how much music customization do you do or manage per... Per wow, that's a whole other talk. <laughs> a whole other talk. Um, and I wish I could give it its, uh, its due. We, we actually wrote an article about this um, in Journal of Music Therapy. Um, Martin, also a, an author on this. Um, we qualitatively sat, sat around as a team. We'd brought all this music together. We sat and we listened for hours and hours and hours. And we sort of ranked things in terms of, you know, did it have good... We were looking at um, things that Mendel Kalin had done. Um, 
we kind of ranked them in terms of um, how suitable it might be, where it might belong, um, if it kind of felt like it was uh, um, intrusive because we wanted music that was gently evocative, like invitational, but not overwhelming. Um, we'd heard um, uh, the Johns Hopkins playlist and we thought there were some really lovely pieces there, but some of them were really, were like um, a bit, whoa. Um, and, um, and then Mendel Kalin's playlist, which is you know very good as well, uh, perhaps you know, I think we, we sort of felt for our participants, perhaps they would need a little more, I guess, tethering with some more predictable kind of chordal progression. I don't mean to sort of go off into kind of music speak. One of the ways we can sort of um, understand where people are at is um, there, there is a very noticeable spike in blood pressure um, when psilocybin um, converts to psilocybin hits your tummy. Um, and when that comes up, we know that people are sort of ascending into phase there. Because we, we have had people where they're just going, oh, I'm just going to go to the toilet. Oh, it's been two and a half hours, nothing's happening. Um, so we know that they're nowhere near peak because they haven't ascended yet. So there's, there's a number of ways that we look at that and then we kind of move peak tracks um, to sort of to, to, to fit with that. Because otherwise it, it could be quite a, a jarring kind of experience for people when they're sort of hearing, you know, more kind of beady things that's sort of more designed to sort of be bringing them uh, out post peak. So, yeah. Sorry, One, that's not a very good question to, to <laughs> ask right at the end. It should like be another whole It's a great question, sure. but anyway, I don't have yeah. time. Sorry. Uh, quick question from the floor, please, and then we'll move on to the end. Thanks, Martin. Um, I just got usurped by that question because that was what I was <laughs> about. Um, yeah, we can we, talk afterwards if you want. Yeah, and that'd be great. I'd like to offer some input on that because obviously clinicians are mm. not necessarily musical curators or no, exactly. DJs per se. And no, and yeah. do you know what we did? Yeah. It's funny. And we were just sort of lucky. So we, we have a, a music therapist in our team um, um, and... I mean, how many of us was blah, blah, blah. have all been classically trained as musicians in a previous life? Yeah. So we kind of had a, a, an idea of, of okay, well, you know, this and that. But um, but you're right. We're fiddling around. Can I, can we I, need someone who kind yeah. of gets this. I can offer some input, which yeah. is that uh, music as a construct is mm. possibly limited in and of itself. I mean, there's yeah. some great audio ecology field recordings. Yeah. Um, the sound of a glacier melting mm. or Mm. Um, there's some beautiful work by people like Douglas Quinn and so on uh, of you know Amazonian field recordings yeah. and so on, talking about um, the actual physical setting being mm. uh, the question relating to the yeah. question before about um, whether you could do it under the stars or in nature. Oh, it would be evoke, magic. You can evoke yeah. that with extremely yeah. high quality field recordings yeah. from uh, far flung places around the world or so on. Yes. So, so, so just quickly, I wanted to say that. Yeah. Um, Sound and music is probably mm. the nomenclature that I would want to go with when mm. talking about this sort of stuff. Music obviously sure. is a huge component to it, but yeah. there is, um, you know, certain music that, uh, or sound that is perhaps drone based or yeah. Yeah. something that's sonorous but not necessarily music, um, conventional music. Yeah. And so. Can, and I, and I can just, before yeah. I forget, I'll tell Please. you that there's a gentleman by the name of Alexander Tannels who's, um, I think, um, he recently gave a, a lecture at the McKenna Academy. Uh, he's an um, ethnomusicologist and talks exactly about this. And he's got a wonderful website if you're interested in looking at it. Um, uh, the, the impact of frequency and, on you know, drone and, and uh, didgeridoo, throat singing, um, and how it can kind of tone uh, you yeah. know, vagus nerve. Yeah. And it was fascinating. So we were, kind of did this wonderful deep dive um, into how we could do this. And you're exactly right. It can evoke such powerful... Because we have a lot of world music in our um, playlist... And people often feel as though they're in forests or jungles or, yeah. or by the water. Uh, um, so it's, uh, you know, it's extraordinary. Music is, just, I mean, sound, but it, it's so evocative. Um, Can I just offer music. that? Um, yeah. I, should, I think I'll have to. Sorry. <laughs> we we can are talk very after close to end. <laughs> make it like 30 20 seconds. seconds. Yeah. So everyone has their own musical sensibilities. So, yeah. So um, I think if you're familiar with the work in Alzheimer's um, yeah. musical therapy, so Alive yeah. Inside, there's a documentary where they play people with Alzheimer's who are non-verbal, mm. et cetera, music from their yeah. youth, and these people instantly mm. start singing, talking, yeah. and it evokes all these memories. So yeah. in terms of the playlist, I mm. would suggest... Um, a little bit more asking relatives, partners, or whoever yeah. the people themselves what uh, their musical sensibilities are, and yeah, we and we we, we do, Yo, we actually fantastic. do. 
Yeah, no, we, we do. We actually do. We actually have three playlists that we offer right. them, which is one of them is the, the, the John Sockers, if they like classical, which is, I mean, it is classic porn. It is just <laughs> extraordinary. <laughs> Wagner. The, anyway, so you know, that for that, some people, that's what they like. Um, the the Mendel Kalen playlist and then our playlist. So they're very different. They're all very different. Um, we do ask them as well. We sort of came up with this idea of having rescue songs. If they've hit a challenging time, three songs that you like, that all... all um, have some association with something kind of, you know, um, pleasurable or, or, or enjoyable. Because can, we can kind of hijack your, um, you know, your autonomic system here. You already have a cued response to this music. It already makes you feel, hey, this is great. So we, we have, uh, we've never needed to use them. We've never needed to use rescue medication either, touch wood. Um, but the, yeah, the idea of using music to settle and soothe, um, I couldn't believe no one had really thought about that before. So that was something we're sort of hoping to kind of contribute to the literature a bit. But thank massive, you so much for your input. Massive kudos to you. Thank you. That was thank, really you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Thanks you very so much. much. Great. Okay. I think that brings us to a close. I'm sorry we, we have run short of time now. So we have a couple more questions, but uh, perhaps those uh, questioners could could uh, catch up with Mark a little later. Overall so. wine. All the very best. Thank you. <laughs> thank very you so much. much again. <laughs>